three, two, one, Dr. Payam. All right, thank you for watching and welcome to another crazy integration session, which might take us a lot of time, but today we will evaluate something really, really cool. Namely, we will evaluate the fractional part of tangent of x. Whoa, and you might say, is this relevant? Of course, it's very relevant with a video that I will do or that I might, I might already have done. So again, I won't talk more about this, but what is the fractional part? So what the frac, okay. <laughs> so let's just recall. The fractional part is exactly what you think of it, it is. The fractional part of pi is fractional part of 3.1415 it's precisely this part here. Anything that's to the right of the decimal point. So it's 0 0.1415, dot, dot, dot. And there's actually a nice formula in terms of the, um, uh, of the floor function. In general, the fractional part of x is x minus the integer part, which makes sense here because that's the same thing as pi minus 3. So pi minus the integer part of three, of pi. And so if you want a little picture, it's actually a very nice integral. What we want to do is, so this is from zero, this is the tangent function from zero to pi over two. But the thing is tangent goes to uh, infinity. So there are lots of fractional parts here. So up to pi over four, Tangent is one, so the fractional part just becomes tangent. But then we continue. Here, tangent is one, so the fractional part is zero, and we wait until it becomes two. Then the function goes like that until the fractional part is again zero, and then we just continue, and then this pull procedure becomes finer and finer. And the question is, if you add up those little wedges here, what is the integral? And does it even converge? And we will see it's very nice and it's related to a quantity that's very mysterious. And it will take us a long time, but there's lots of excitement happening. So let's actually start for reasons that will be much clearer later, it turns out it's easier to evaluate the integral of the fractional part of cotangent of x. And I will explain you later why this works. And it turns out we can make an easy substitution to make this work. So let u be pi over two minus x, then integral from zero to pi over two of what we want tangent of x, dx, that's. Remember u of zero is pi over two, u of pi over two is zero. So we're flipping those, so from pi over two to zero, of fractional part of tangent of, just put them on the left, right hand side, pi over two minus u, and then du is minus dx, or dx is minus du, because of the minus sign, the thing get, gets flipped back. So integral from zero to pi over two. Oh, fractional part of tangent of pi over two over u, which is sine of pi over two minus u, cosine of pi over two minus u, du, but then sine of pi over two minus blah is cosine of blah. So cosine of u over sine of u, u, but that's the same thing as integral from 0 to pi over 2 of fractional part of cotangent of u du. So all we need to evaluate is the integral with cotangent, which surprisingly is easier to evaluate. Again, okay, that's one of the moments where math is very strange, but it works. So now let's look at cotangent. So 
cotangent, well, just like, so opposite of tangent, tangent goes from zero to infinity, cotangent goes from, from infinity to zero, something like that. So in particular, it goes to all the integers. And one thing that's nice is we would like to sort of classify them by the integer value. So for example, we want to say, take the region where cotangent is between 17 and 18, because then the fractional part is easier to evaluate. So given n and n plus 1, look at the region where it's strictly between n and n plus 1, but those things are given precisely by the arc cotangent of n and arc cotangent of n plus 1. And notice in particular that if you look at all those regions with n, they really give us a partition of the interval 0 comma pi over 2. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, so clarity, let me put that here, I'm trying to say that the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of the fractional part of cotangent of x dx, that's the same as saying take all those regions, arc cotangent of n plus 1, to arc cotangent of n of this fractional part, and take the sum over all the n's. n equals to 0 to infinity. Once you take that, indeed, if you add up all those integrals, you do get the integral of cotangent of x, the fractional part of cotangent of x. And why is this important? Because remember this formula, we have cotangent of x, the fractional part, equals to cotangent of x minus the, the floor of cotangent of x. But here, because cotangent is between n and n plus 1, the floor is just n. So it's like we're hitting the party on the floor. The floor is n. <laughs> the floor is lava, and then you, know, you can't touch it. OK, well, this becomes sum n from 0 to infinity of integral arc cotangent of n plus 1 to arc cotangent of n of cotangent of x minus n dx. And even though this is smaller than this one, it's nicer to switch them up to have n plus 1 on the top. So let's switch top and bottom, and we get sum from 0 to infinity of r cotangent of n to r cotangent of n plus 1 of cotangent of x minus n dx. Okay. And now, well, cotangent, not the worst thing in the world to evaluate, because remember that integral of cotangent of x dx, it's ln of sine of x technically absolute values, but I think here we're okay. So, what this becomes is integral sine minus sum from 0 to infinity of ln of sine of arc cotangent of n plus 1 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of n. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. Let me see. Oh, I forgot to close the parentheses. And then minus n times this thing, minus n times arc cotangent of n plus 1 minus arc cotangent of n. You may have guessed this, but because of this n plus 1 and n, this is, in fact, a telescoping sum. But let's just be a little bit careful because of stuff that might happen at infinity. So just to be careful, let's just write this as minus limit 
n goes to infinity of the sum of from n from 0 to m of, I get ln of sine of arc cotangent of n plus 1 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of n minus n arc cotangent of n plus 1 plus n arc cotangent of n. And so, just to make sure, let me expand out that limit. So, it becomes ln of sine of arc cotangent of 1 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 0 plus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 2 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 1 nasty, yeah, plus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 3 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 2 dot 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 plus ln of sine of arc cotangent of n plus 1 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of n. I will write the other part down too, but let's just see what happens here already. Well, everything diagonal disappears, so bang, 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 bang. And you're really left with minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 0 plus blah 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 of m plus 1. Okay. And now let's see what happens to the other term. It's not quite a telescoping sum, but still very, very nice. Minus 0 arc cotangent of 1 plus 0 arc cotangent of 0 minus 1 arc cotangent of 2 plus 1 arc cotangent of 1 minus 2 arc cotangent of 3 plus 2 arc cotangent of 2 dot 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 minus m arc cotangent of m plus 1 plus m arc cotangent of m. Okay, so unfortunately if you consider the diagonal things they don't quite cancel out, but the nice thing is if you take the coefficients, 1 minus 0 gives you 1, 2 minus 1 gives you 1, minus 2 plus 3 gives you 1, and then m plus m minus 1 gives you 1. And so even though you don't have, you know, uh, and cancellation, you still have stuff like arc cotangent of 1 plus arc cotangent of 2, 2, dot, 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 up to arc cotangent of n, plus the remaining terms. So you're left with, well, 0 arc cotangent of 0, which is 0, this junk, and then a sum, the sum of arc cotangent. Not quite what we want, but still pretty nice. So, before I erase this whiteboard, what we're left with, we're, what we're left with are this term, this term, this term, and then this series of arc cotangents, of arc cotangents. Conclusion. Our answer is precisely minus limit m goes to infinity of ln of sine of arc cotangent of m plus 1 minus ln of sine of arc cotangent of 0 plus the series of cotangents dot 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 plus cotangent arc cotangent of m plus 1 minus m arc cotangent of m plus 1. Let me just double check. Da, da, da. Yes. 
sorry, uh, it should be uh, M. So all we need to do is calculate this series and those LNs and stuff. Well, uh, first of all, let's clean this stuff a little bit up. So let's figure out what LN of sine of arc cotangent is. So step two, do a little bit of cleanup. Because it turns out this stuff can get simplified tremendously. So what is sine of r cotangent of x? Uh, and this takes us back to the triangle method from calculus. So let theta be r cotangent of x, then cotangent of x, because our cotangent of theta equals to x. That's by definition of arc, you know, this arc cotangent. And then let's just draw a triangle whose cotangent equals to x. So maybe here, cotangent is adjacent over opposite, something like that. And then sine of arc cotangent of x, that's sine of theta, and that's opposite over hypotenuse, which becomes one over square root of x squared plus one by the Pythagorean theorem. So sine of r cotangent of x equals to one over square root of x squared plus one. And so in particular, sine of r cotangent of zero equals to one and then We'll see about the other one. So sine of r cotangent of zero then becomes one over square root of zero squared plus one, which is one over one, which is one. So if you take ln of this, you get ln of one, which is zero. Which means that this part completely disappears Moreover, let's figure out about this part. So, in other words, we want to figure out what happens to this as x goes to infinity. As x goes to infinity, well, sine of r cotangent of x, well, that's equal to some, equals to 1 over square root of x squared plus 1. But if x goes to infinity, this one becomes negligent or negligible. So sorry for using engineering notation, but it's, it's one over square root of x squared, and that's equal to one over x. So if you take ln of this, ln of sine of r cotangent of uh, x, Asymptotically, it's like ln of 1 over x, which is minus ln of x. So the point is, as m goes to infinity, this is asymptotically equal to minus ln of m plus 1. But if m is very large, this is almost the same as minus ln of m. Very good. So this is like minus ln of m, this is zero, this is the sum of r cotangent, and then this one, if you do L'Hopital's rule and everything, you can show that as m goes to infinity, this goes to one. Again, you just write m as one over one over m, use L'Hopital's rule, and then you're good. Therefore, our answer becomes the following, equals to minus limit m, m goes to infinity of minus ln of m plus the sum of a bunch of arc cotangents, 1 to infinity of. 
are cotangents of n minus 1. Sorry. So, or cotangents of n minus 1. Plus 2. Our answer becomes limit m goes to infinity. This minus, let's just put it everywhere. So, ln of m minus the sum from n from 1 to m. I'm sorry, m from 1 to m of our cotangent of n. And then minus minus 1, that's plus 1. In fact, now we can let m go to infinity, so it equals to limit m goes to infinity of ln of m minus sum from n from 1 to infinity of our cotangent of n plus 1. I apologize. We don't put this infinity here. We put it here. We just still do the sum up to m. So we want to figure out, in other words, how does ln of m compare to this series of arc cotangents? Left with this, the answer is limit m goes to infinity of ln of m minus the series of unfortunate events, so a series of arc cotangent, this thing, and then minus minus 1 is plus 1. So the answer then just boils down to how does the series of arc cotangents behave with respect to the series of ln and it's kind of tricky of course because those are of two very different natures so how about let's write this arc cotangent in fact in terms of ln you may say can we do that yes we can so again because of ln the generous you know very good. <laughs> so step three. Right. Arc cotangent of n in terms of ln. Of ln. And the cool thing is we can do that by going into the complex world. So if z is a complex number, well, cotangent of z is cosine of z over sine of z. But cosine is e to the iz plus e to the minus iz over 2 over e to the iz minus e to the minus iz over 2i. And you can show this by using, you know, ei theta equals to cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. But the nice thing is, those twos, they cancel out, and 1 over i becomes just i. So you get i times e to the iz plus e to the minus iz over e to the iz minus e to the minus iz. It's almost take it easy, except you take it e to the iz. Okay, now suppose we have that z equals to r cotangent of n. So we want to simplify this. Then, of course, cotangent of z equals to n. And therefore, this whole jump here, which is cotangent of z, is actually equal to m. And so, from this huge equation, we want to find z. Like, where's Waldo for like complex analysis version? So, well, no problem. Take this equation, cross multiply this, times e to the i z plus e to the minus i z equals to n times e to the i z minus e to the minus i z. Well, we don't really like this minus signs, so let's just multiply both sides by e to the i z, and we get i 
e to the 2iz plus 1 equals to n e to the 2iz minus 1. And then what do we do? Expand this out. i e to the 2iz plus i equals to n e to the 2iz minus n. So e to the 2iz times i minus 1, so i minus n equals to a minus n minus i. So e to the 2iz equals to minus n minus i over i minus n. And then if we multiply both sides by minus i and minus i and minus n minus i, so the complex conjugate, you actually find this is the same as, um, oops, sorry, never mind. I minus n, and that's the same thing as, if you're minus n plus i over minus n minus i, this cancels out, and you get n plus i over n minus i. Great, we get e to the 2iz equals to this junk, and then let's see what we get. So, e to the 2iz equals to n plus i over n minus i, then take ln, so 2iz equals to ln of n plus i over n minus i, and it's kind of weird why I do that, but it turns out it makes the rest easier. Let's factor out ln from both, let's factor out n from both sides. n times 1 plus 1 i plus 1 times n of 1 minus i over n. And the reason is I want to do a power series, and power series are good when the modulus of this is less than 1. So that's why I'm doing this. And so you're left with ln of 1 plus i over n minus ln of 1 minus i over n. By the way, complex lns, they do exist. They're a bit complicated, but they work. So 2iz equals to this. So if you divide by 2i on both sides, we get that z equals to the following z equals to 1 over 2i, that's the same as minus i over 2, and that's you get by multiplying both sides by i, top and bottom by i, and you're left with minus i over 2, ln of 1 plus i over n, minus ln of 1 minus i over n. And this solves our problem because z, it's the same thing as r cotangent of n, which is i over 2, ln of 1 minus i over n, minus ln of 1 plus i over n. <laughs> Again, what is nicer, this thing or this thing? Well, you would argue that the left-hand side is nicer, but remember our goal. Our goal was to compare our cotangent with ln. So if we already transform our cotangent into ln, it brings us a step closer to our solution. I know, and it gets worse because we have this. Now we want the sum of our cotangent. So step four cotangent series from 1 to infinity of cotangent of n by what we had now was i over 2 sum of those ln's ln of 1 minus i over n minus ln of 1 plus i over n but here's the cool thing we can actually expand this out as a power series and let me remind you of that so how ln of 1 minus x, that's the same as minus 1 sum from k to from 1 to infinity of x over k 
over k. And that's valid as long as the thing absolute value of x is less than 1. So we're good here. So in particular, ln of 1 minus i over n, that's the same thing as minus k from 1 to infinity of i to the k. If one is i over n, let's do it this way. So uh, i over n to the k over k. And that's minus sum from k from 1 to infinity of i to the k over n to the k over k. So times 1 over k. And similarly, if you do this, ln of 1 plus i over n, that's ln of 1 minus minus i over n. It's the same junk except with the minus i. So sum minus sum from k from 1 to infinity of minus i to the k, k n to the k. Okay, <laughs> yay. <laughs> and now, okay, I, 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 I was a bit non-rigorous. I wanted to do the sum from 1 to infinity. I wanted to do the sum from 1 to m, but let's just do the sum from 1 to infinity for now, and then the rest is similar. Okay, so by what I just erased, the uh, sum from the series of arc cotangent, 1 to infinity of arc cotangent of n, then becomes, again, i over 2, sum of ln of 1 minus i over n minus ln of 1 plus i over n. If you use those power series, you get minus i over 2 sum from n equals to 1 to infinity sum from k equals to 1 to infinity of 1 over k i to the k over n to the k plus i over 2 sum n equals to 1 to infinity sum k equals to 1 to infinity of minus i to the k, k, n to the k. By the way, if you're still watching, I'm pretty proud of you, and it's a long integral. But again, this thing I got from this part, and this other part I got from this other part. Okay. All right, and now we want to, well, let's simplify this. Let's see, can we simplify this? Uh, uh, yeah, we can Fubini this. Okay. So in other words, let's just interchange the n and k, and you'll see why it's useful. k from 1 to infinity, sum from n from 1 to infinity, of 1 over k, i to the k, n to the k, plus i over 2, sum from k equals to 1 to infinity, sum from n equals to 1 to infinity of minus i to the k, k, n to the k. And the nice thing is, anything that doesn't depend on i, on k, sorry, anything that doesn't depend on n, you can pull out. So we can put this sum here, and it's same with this minus i. We will do that. Turns out, let's just separate one of the sums, because it turns out uh, this one part will be very useful, namely, let's separate the k equal to 1 terms. So we will have some junk minus, if you want, i over 2, sum k from 2 to infinity, i to the k over k, sum from n equals to 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the k, plus i over 2, sum from k equals to 2 to infinity, sum from n equals to 1, or oh, sorry, minus i to the k over k, sum from n equals to 1 to infinity of 
1 over n to the k. And now, let's do the k equals to 1 terms. Because then you're left with minus i over 2 sum from n equals to 1 to infinity of 1 over 1 i, so i to the 1 over 1, 1 over n, plus i over 2 sum from n equals to 1 to infinity of minus i over 1 times 1 over n. Again, take a moment to admire this. It's pretty exhausting, but it's a beautiful integral. Let's clean this up a little bit. i to the 1. If you multiply this by i, you get minus 1. So in the end, you have 1 half. 1 half times this scary sum. And then you have, again, i over 2 times minus i. So you also have 1 half times the sum of n, 1 over n. So in the end, you have this divergent series, which is very bad, sum from n from 1 to infinity of 1 over n minus those interesting functions, minus i over 2 sum from k equals to 2 to infinity i, over, I to the k over k. And now, you may or you may not know this, but if you don't know this, I'm happy to you know, uh, introduce this to you. Those sums, they're what's called the Riemann zeta function. So it's the same as what's called zeta to the k. And in general, zeta to the blah is sum over 1 over n to the blah. And so in fact, those things can be conveniently written in terms of the Riemann zeta function as follows. So minus i to the k over k, zeta of k, plus i over 2, sum from k equals to 2 to infinity of minus i to the k over k, zeta of k. I'd like to remind you that's the same thing as the series of arc cotangent. By the way, this, in case you're still you're wondering, uh, the reason we use arc cotangent is to have this 1 over n to the k. If you use tangent, you would have the series of n to the k, which is you know, divergent, whereas the zeta functions, are, in this case, are convergent. So this is the subtlety that made this cotangent work. Because I tried it with tangent at first, and it went, got very ugly. OK, so what do we have here now? We have you know, uh, this series of our cotangent is this. And now we can plug it into our answer. Now, we recall our answer. Our answer was 1 plus uh, you know, limit n goes to infinity of ln of n minus the series of arc cotangent. So n from 1 to infinity, or n from 1 from m, doesn't matter, of arc cotangent. Yeah, there is this issue of going from n or stuff, but it's like to sweep it under the rug. It turns out that's the same as 1 plus limit n goes to infinity of ln of m minus this series, but again, let's just modify it with m, 1 over m, and then minus those two things, so plus i over 2 sum k from 2 to infinity of i to the k over k, zeta of k minus i over 2 sum from k from
from 2 to infinity of minus i to the k to the k zeta of k. And this is our answer, but of course we would like to simplify it a little bit. But it's already very, very nice. We took this very strange R cotangent series and we turned this into a nicer series. Of course, 1 over n, the series is divergent. But it turns out that it's actually very close to ln of m. And in fact, it turns out it's so close that the difference between the two just becomes a constant. So here's some step 5. So here's our first fact. I will not prove it because <laughs> it's already taking one hour. It might take two hours if I prove that. Limit m goes to infinity ln of m minus the harmonic series 1 from m of 1 over m. This limit exists and is a negative number. And because this is a negative number, we call this minus gamma. And this is what's called the Euler, Euler Mascheroni constant. Constant. Here's sort of the idea. We have the ln, and then we have the series. Well, the series of 1 over n, you know, in terms of rectangle, is bigger than ln, but it turns out if you take all the sum of those junks, like the difference between areas, it converges, in this case, to a negative number, and so we get minus gamma. Again, hard to prove, but it's true. And here's the second fact, because this should remind you a little bit of power series but power series with coefficients gamma k, sorry, uh, zeta k, also very difficult to prove, but maybe not difficult, but this one is a bit more tedious. So the sum from 2 to infinity of gamma of zeta k over k, x to the k, equals to minus exactly this constant, so gamma x plus, believe it or not, the Euler, the gamma function comes into play, ln of gamma of 1 minus x. Whoa, you know, and in fact, this is maybe the key equality to our proof. And you may ask, again, beautiful. I would say this is sort of the analog of Euler's formula, because it, but advanced, because it, Euler's formula that says e to the i pi plus 1 equals to 0, it puts all the elementary functions together, right? 0, 1, e, i, pi. This is like the adult version of it, because it puts the gamma function, the euler mascheroni constant, and the zeta function together. Pretty sweet. But if you're just wondering how, it, how in the world can you prove this, is if you let this to be g of x, this is like a power series. So the idea is, right, show g of 0 equals to 0, g prime of 0 equals to 0. It's not a problem. But more precisely, show that the kth coefficient equals precisely to zeta k over k. And it's not hard to prove, but it's uh, every, everywhere I read this, it's a big pain to prove because you have to differentiate this function k times. And it gets more and more messier and messier. So and just for the sake of this video, I won't do it, <laughs> but more importantly, how can you use it? Well, look, in this series, you can plug in x equals to i. So in particular, with x equals to i, 
we get sum from 2 to infinity of zeta k over k i to the k equals to minus gamma i plus ln of gamma 1 minus i and for x equals to minus i we get sum k from 2 to infinity gamma zeta k over k minus i to the k equals to so gamma i plus ln of gamma 1 plus i. Okay, that's good. That's all the steps that we need. Now we can conclude. Actually, not quite. So it's, it's, it's a long video. So uh, <laughs> we can conclude this step if you'd like. Answer. So what's our answer? I even forgot where we were. So we had, uh, yeah. Right, our answer was 1 plus limit n goes to infinity of ln of n minus sum of 1 over n and then all our zeta functions. So in the end, what we get is 1 minus gamma, because this limit is minus gamma, and then plus i over 2, and then the first formula, minus gamma i plus ln of gamma of 1 minus i. And then, I guess, um, this, so i over 2, and then minus i over 2, gamma i plus ln of gamma of 1 plus i. Okay, and then we can clean this up a little bit, so we're left with, and so we have 1 minus gamma, and then if you expand that out, you indeed get plus gamma over 2, and then uh, I guess uh, plus i over 2, ln of gamma of 1 minus i, plus gamma over 2, and then minus I guess plus i over 2 if you want, minus ln of gamma 1 plus i. And lo and behold, we didn't even need to talk about the Euler constant because gamma over 2 plus gamma over 2 is gamma, and it cancels out with gamma, and we get our answer is 1 plus i over 2 ln of gamma of 1 minus i over gamma of 1 plus i. And you think we're done? Well, if you like this gamma function like that, yeah, you can say we're done. But it turns out we can simplify this even more. So just a couple more steps. Because there's another fact coming. Is another neat fact. Fact three, namely, if you take gamma of z times gamma of 1 minus z, turns out there's a nice simplification that's pi over sin, sine of pi z. And this is a nice formula. Uh, I will prove it probably because it uses some nice complex analysis. And in particular, this says that gamma of 1 minus z is pi over gamma of z sine of pi z. Good, because then, in particular, gamma of 1 minus i, that's pi over gamma of i sine of pi i. But it turns out we can simplify sine of pi i in terms of functions that we know. But sine of pi i, uh, sine of theta is e to the i theta, so e to the i pi i minus e to the minus pi i i minus i pi i over 2i 
and that's minus i over 2 e to the minus pi minus e to the pi and then we can simplify this so it's i over 2 e to the pi minus e to the minus pi that's i times e to the pi minus e to the minus pi over 2 and that's i sinh of pi cool so gamma of 1 minus i you can write this as if you're on pi over gamma of i i sinh of pi i Oh, sinh of pi, sorry. And what about gamma of 1 plus i? Turns out much simpler. Because remember, the gamma function it behaves like factorials. So gamma of 1 plus i is just i gamma of i. Because gamma of 1 plus z it's z gamma of z. Okay, and now let's put everything together and get our answer. Huh? Answer then becomes, so it's, I guess, remember one plus i over two, ln of, Again, gamma of 1 minus i, which is, remember, pi over i, cinch of pi, gamma of i. And then you have gamma of 1 plus i, which is i, gamma of i. And this is the same as 1 plus i over 2 ln of i squared, which is minus 1, which goes on top, minus pi over sinh of pi, gamma of i squared. I think now we can celebrate in order to cry, <laughs> because we finally found our answer. The moral of the story is integral from 0 to pi over 2, fractional part of tangent of x dx is 1 plus i over 2 ln of minus pi over sinh of pi gamma of i squared. Ta-da! Take a moment to admire this. Of course, unfortunately, um, this, you know, let's talk about the elephant of the room. This gamma i, we don't really know what the value is. There's no, not a much closer formula for this. But the nice thing is, if you take this integral for granted, it gives you a new meaning for gamma of i. So maybe as a bonus, let me talk about a consequence of this. So consequence. Consequence, okay, because suppose you call this i, and again, take this integral as a given. Suppose it's an integral that you accept in nature, okay, it's a new constant, a pi m constant, okay, then what we get from this is i minus 1 equals to i over 2, ln of minus pi over sinh of pi, gamma i squared, and then that's the same as i over 2 ln of, let's split this up a little bit, minus pi over sinh of pi. By the way, I'm aware that this is probably negative or something, but it's fine. It's, we're talking complex logs, so it's fine. And then 
plus, I guess minus I over 2 ln of, so ln of 1 over gamma of I squared. Well, you can simplify this a little bit. So that's the same as uh, I over 2 ln of minus pi over sinh of pi. And then, so ln of minus, so it becomes plus i over 2, and then 2 ln of gamma i. Simplify that. And now, let's just use that and solve for ln of gamma i. So, ln of gamma i equals to i, if you want, uh, let's see, um, so if you want i over i times this equals to i minus 1 minus i over 2 ln of minus pi over sinh of pi, you divide by, L, by i and you get ln of gamma i equals to so i. All this by i, which is same as multiplying by minus i. So minus i i plus i, and then minus i, plus, uh, minus i times minus i. So 1, so plus 1 half ln of minus pi over sinh of pi. And then you take, take this to you know, raise this to the e, so you get gamma i equals to e to the minus i i, e to the i, and then e to the one half ln of minus pi over sinh of pi, and then if you want that's e to the i, one minus i, and this is like uh, minus pi, sinh of pi, and you take square root of that. So it gives you, if you accept this integral as a given, you have a new formula for gamma i. Maybe a sign mistake somewhere, but you get gamma i equals to e to the i, one minus i, square root, of minus pi over sinh of pi. Again, where i is your integral, zero from pi over two, arctangent of x dx. Which answers one of our questions I pose either in a video that's gonna come or that I've already made. Still need to decide. And so this is another formula for uh, or gamma function. I forgot to say uh, this square root of minus one. You can also write it as one uh, times i, and then you have this formula in the end. So. Congratulations for surviving. I know that was a very tricky integral, but hopefully it was fascinating to you as well. And if you like this integral and other math stuff, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.